Well, hello there, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. I have missed you all. If you are brand new to the channel and you start to like or love what you are listening to, please join us by hitting that subscribe button and also changing your bell notification to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video. Also, if you're interested in becoming a member, the information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is now time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Crazy Exes. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right before I read the first story, there will be an ad. And afterwards, there will be no more ads placed in this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. When I was 23, I was renting my first place when my ex-girlfriend reached out to me. We had dated for X amount of months in high school. It's been over 10 years since high school, and I can't remember how long it was. It just went badly because I was a douche and started talking to another girl. Anyway, my ex said she was over what happened when we were teenagers and was willing to give it another shot. So we have a date, and the several dates and things are doing very well. Well, a month into our relationship, one night while I'm at work on a late shift, she calls me saying that she had gotten into an argument with her mother. They had gotten into some sort of domestic about something. She got slapped and needed to cool off at my place. I got home and turns out she was moving in. I'm pretty laid back and wanted help with the rent anyways, so I somewhat was okay with it. I mean, I knew I was walking into a snake pit, but I didn't know I was walking into a viper pit. So we lived together for a whopping two months when things take a turn. She starts telling me she's insecure about me, talking to girls. Then that changes to watching porn as well, which didn't work. I have control issues. We start fighting a lot, sometimes all night long. She starts cutting herself, saying it's all my fault, and ends up getting tetanus. Late phone calls asking where I am at work and who I'm with. I work late hours at an ambulance service. Things come to a head one night when the crazy ex tries to tell me I'm looking at porn is the same as beating her. She starts screaming at me, bringing up all the cutting and the doctor visits, claiming it's my fault. I got fed up and tell her to move the hell out of my apartment. This pushes her off the deep end and grabs my handgun that I keep for self-defense. Tells me she'll kill me, then herself. I call the police. She leaves shortly afterwards after she throws my loaded gun aside. I think, yay, it's finally over. But it wasn't just yet. So a few days go by without incident. The crazy ex texts me saying she needs to give me her house key. I tell her to just throw it away, but she drives to my house anyway, leaves the key and tapes a note to my door, saying I'm mentally ill and need help, and she forgives me, blah, 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 blah. I stopped reading after the I need help part, and she keeps texting and texting, asking if I read it even going as far as blaming her behavior on pregnancy, saying that the baby is mine, but she lost it due to stress. So here I am years down the road, married to a wonderful two-year-old hellion with no regrets of leaving the crazy ex. I really hope that I don't run into her ever again. I used to work at Borders way back when, though I had another job at the mall. Something about being at the bookstore made me much more recognizable, I guess. I often had people approach me when I was on the street 
or asked me about the store's sales, etc. while I was at the drive through window. It was mostly harmless stuff, though I got some creeps on occasion. At the time, I had a dating profile up, but I had to take it down because I'd start getting weird messages from men saying they saw me at the grocery store or something and wanted to touch themselves. Just bizarre shit. The killing blow that made me finally close it, however, came shortly before my 19th birthday. I was checking my account after work, and I see a message titled, We've Met, which immediately creeped me out. I clicked on it, and it read, Sort of. Before proceeding to go into this very weird graphic depiction of this guy who was apparently so thrilled by my cashiering skills that I caused a stirring in his loins. This email was seriously like three pages long, talking about how sexually excited he was and all of the things he could do to my very young body. I was horrified to think that one of my customers had been looking at me like that, thinking those things about me. I clicked on his profile. No photo. It said he was 56 and single, but no other information. I needed to know what he looked like, which is the only reason I replied, and I imagine that was his game all along. I didn't respond to any of the other stuff he said, but I asked him if he'd send me a photo. He told me that he couldn't put one up because he's sort of a public figure, but he told me he'd email it to me. It took him two days to get back to me. Those were two very long days. While I waited, I looked at my message history and discovered that this guy had actually written me many, multiple times. I'd ignore him because, one, no pictures, and two, way out of the age group I was looking for. Out of morbid curiosity, I looked at the messages. All of them were filled with sexually graphic things he wanted to do to me. He talked about fantasies of using me with another man that he knew, acting out sexually assault scenes, tying me up, etc. Some of the details were specific just to me, which leads me to believe he wasn't just sending them en masse to every young woman on the site. Meanwhile, this guy is older than my dad. I spent the next two days tensing around every older man who came in. I was afraid to be friendly to any of them for fear that one of them would be this guy, and he'd take it as a go-ahead to come at me. I was having a birthday celebration the day he finally got back to me. The moment I saw his name, I got a bad feeling in my gut. I couldn't immediately place it, but I knew there was something wrong with this person writing these things to me. I stared at it for a moment, positive I knew this guy. But my brain would not let it click. I texted my friend to confirm with her as it began to dawn on me. This man was my high school principal. I was horrified. I was still 18 at the time, which means that he must have been creeping on a bunch of us all along. I remember being alone with him in his office, and it makes me feel queasy. Is he just perched and waiting for girls to graduate so he can legally pounce? I wrote him back and told him, I don't know if you remember me, but you are my high school principal, and I happen to know that you are married. He didn't reply, and I thought that was the end of it. I was still super creeped out for a while after that, though, just knowing how long he'd been thinking about me and sending these graphic messages when he'd been an authority figure in my formative years. Almost a year passed without incident, and he didn't come in when I was there. But one day, I started ringing someone up without getting a good look at his face. It was a friendly exchange right up until I made eye contact. It was him again, and he was grinning at me. I put his stuff in his bag and turned away from the register, but he stayed where he was. I pretended to organize some returns, but he just kept standing there, silently, not moving or anything. I knew he was watching me, but I didn't want to look. The moment lasted far too long. 
So finally, I grab my headset and ask for a manager to come to the front of the store. He hurried out after that, and I never saw him again. This happened about 14 years ago, when I was in my second year of university and living in a student flat. I was 19 at the time and very into my space and used to chat to friends and friends of friends on there. A few of my friends were models, which is how I stumbled across the guy named Joe. Joe was a professional photographer and was starting to really make a name for himself with his edgy and provocative photos. With hindsight, I can see he was just a Terry Richardson wannabe, which should have been a giant red flag in itself. But at the time, I thought his style was cool and his work was impressive. He was working with celebrities and shooting for big fashion magazines. So I was really surprised when he replied to my message, complimenting him on his work. We started talking regularly, and soon he was very keen to come and visit me. He was living in London, and I was studying in Winchester, which is just over an hour by train. So, I didn't think it would be a big deal. I eventually agreed and met him at the station. From the start, he was very intense. He grabbed my face and started kissing me hard as soon as he saw me. I was pretty taken aback. He suggested we go back to my place to watch a film, and I agreed which was the first of many stupid mistakes. I'm not going to lie, but I'm also not going to get into explicit detail. You know, stuff happened. It was all fine and consensual to start with, but it quickly escalated into some rougher stuff and him pushing pretty hard for me. I said no, and he proceeded to give me the whole, I came all this way to see you, and you're going to be like this? guilt speech. I wished I could go back in time and tell my teenage self to kick him out, but I was young and stupid and didn't want to be rude. However, I did stand my ground and we didn't have sex, but he also wouldn't leave. He said it was too far of a drive to travel back and it was also getting late, so he'd have to stay over. I had one of the most uncomfortable sleepless nights of my life and was too embarrassed to tell my housemates what was going on. Thankfully, he left first thing in the morning, and I hoped to never speak to him again. He tried messaging a few times, and I didn't reply. But this isn't the end of the story. Cut to a few years later, and I see some friends on Facebook posting about Joe. They're sharing horror stories about him. Turns out a few girls I knew had similar experiences with him along with the news that he had been charged with a few counts of sexual assault. Apparently, his success as a photographer gave him just the position of power he needed to force himself on young models, under the premise of getting them more work and magazine covers. Several news sites picked it up, particularly because of his celebrity connections. He was sentenced to 33 months in prison and banned from working with children and vulnerable adults. I definitely got off lucky and felt extremely guilty for not sharing my experience with friends earlier. But that's still not the end of the story either. Cut to about six years ago, and I was working in social media at a big agency in London. I hated it and was using LinkedIn a lot to try and find a new job when I got a message from a guy I didn't know about, some potential freelance work. He said he was starting a new agency, which could potentially lead to more full-time work down the line. He suggested we meet up at a well-known hotel to talk more. This seemed a little odd to me, but I was really keen to leave where I was working. In the middle of planning this, his messages started saying, You don't recognize me, do you? His avatar wasn't a close-up photo, so I opened it up to take a closer look and froze. It's Joe, but with a different name. Apparently, he changed it after he was released. I was so shocked and angry, I could not believe he almost lured me to meet him again. 
I told him I had no intention of meeting up with him, and he told me to not believe everything I read. Needless to say, I disconnected from him on LinkedIn. I just went through my old LinkedIn messages to find the ones from him and did a search for his new name on Google. I don't know if it's the same guy, but the second search result that comes up against his name is details of an arrest for a violent crime in 2015. His LinkedIn account is now disabled. He seems to have disappeared again. Let's hope it's for the good this time and I never run into him again. I lived in a van and traveled the country working seasonal jobs. When I would get somewhere new, I used to use Tinder to meet new friends. Anyways, I was in the Auburn, Washington area and had a few drinks at the bar, hoping to meet locals. When I left the bar, it was dark. I was walking to my van when I heard somebody say my first name and then full last name. Missed red flag. I lived six states over. Nobody but the guy who checked my ID at the bar would know my last name. I turned around and saw this guy sitting on some bricks smoking a cigarette. I say, yeah, that's me, without thinking. He said, hi, my name is Chris. We matched on Tinder. I stood with him and we talked. He said he lived right there, pointing to the door behind the bar that leads to the studios on the second story. We hung out, had a drink or two. He invited me up for dinner, cooked it in the community kitchen. I wasn't planning on going into his place, but I was talking about Magic the Gathering, and he said he had some cards and was wondering if I wanted to check them out. So I agreed. His studio was literally the size of a closet. It had a bed in it and a fridge. There was a little nook in the corner that had a shower and toilet. It was less than a hundred square feet, I swear. I looked through his cards and told him nothing I was interested in. He said it figures because they were given to him, and he does not play. The next day, I go to the local game store to play Magic the Gathering. And guess who walks in? He offers to get drinks, and I decline. I tell him I will add him on Facebook and message him if I change my mind. He gives me his name and looks over my shoulder while I type it in on the app. His face pops up and I tap on his profile. Then I see it. 500 mutual friends. I don't live anywhere near here. I had been here for three days. Then I think, oh, I am friends with a lot of drag performers on Facebook. Maybe he is too. I add him and leave. Once in my van, I get on Tinder for the first time since getting there. I swipe and I swipe and I swipe. I pay the $4.99 to get more swipes. I swipe and I swipe and I swipe. I don't see him. Where is he? This Chris guy. Two hours later, I find him. I open his profile. 500 mutual friends. I swipe right. Nothing happens. It doesn't say, you've got a match. Not only have we never matched, but he didn't even swipe on me. Was he trying to hide the profile? I felt like I kept seeing him that week. I didn't want it to cause me to change travel plans and leave early, but it started to freak me out. He would show up at the bar that I was at or the game store when I was there, even though he told me that he didn't play magic. I started to get really uneasy, so I checked his Facebook profile again. All of the mutual friends were my close friends. My childhood friends, my family, my teachers, my co-workers. I couldn't handle it anymore and changed my entire winter plans just to get out of the situation. So, hopefully, I'll never see Chris around again. I was raised with shame and disrespect. 
so it followed that I would choose inappropriate partners as an adult. I'll skip to the worst, because sadly, there is more than one story for me. I had split from my husband and moved back home with my toddler to care for my dying mother in Las Vegas. She continued her verbal and emotional abuse, and this time, it included my son. So, I planned to leave once again. At that time, I had a semi-boyfriend, more like just an amusement to pass the time. But he was often drunk, drugged out of his mind and mean, so I was eager to leave. I stupidly gave him an address to write to me. I left everything behind, sold my car for a ride to the bus station, and went back up to Montana to start over. With nothing but my son and some clothes, my ex-husband was kind enough to let me and our boys stay with him and his future wife until I got my own place. But a knock at the door changed all of that. It was Jay, the guy from Vegas. He had stalked me up to Montana. All sorts of bad events followed, including rape. Fast forward a bit. I'm forced to stay in the homeless shelter because of Jay. He was causing trouble. He was always around the entrance waiting for me to leave the building. One night, I had my son in the shelter for a visit, and when I left the building for some fresh air, my father-in-law rushed up to see me and yanked my son from my arms. People were screaming that guy stole her baby. Jay had passed a forged check at my father-in-law's bar, so not only did he take my son, I was arrested at the same time and spent the night in jail. The next day, I was released and went to a homeless clinic held once a month. I was diagnosed with PTSD, depression, and pregnancy. I had no options left. Jay had run off to Wyoming, where his mother was, to avoid jail. I contacted him and, in my condition, believed him when he told me how his mother was a pillar of the community how he would have a place to live, furniture, how he would be going to AA, etc. Bunch of lies, basically. I had lost everything, including my beloved son. So, I went. I found myself trapped, held prisoner, locked inside a dumpy trailer with no running water in the middle of a freezing winter. He wouldn't let me use the payphone to call my family. He told me the corner store thought I was a thief, so I wasn't allowed to use the restroom there anymore. I was raped repeatedly. He refused to take me to the doctor and began selling the furniture donated to us so he could get meth. He refused to buy food, preferring his beer and expired sandwiches donated by his mom from the store she worked at. By this point, I had lost all of my friends, my family, my self-respect. I had no belongings, no money, nobody to help me. It was the worst experience of my life. I truly wanted to die, but my pregnancy saved my life. One night, he passed out early and had left the front door unlocked. I escaped in my bare feet in the snow, running to the first neighbor I could find. There was a motel nearby and one of the workers had a room. He opened the door and let me inside. I hid inside his garbage while Jace screamed, Where is that bitch? I'm gonna kill her. I was terrified. Eventually, Jay left, and this amazing kind stranger fed me for the first time in days. He let me sleep in his bed while he took the floor. I was able to shower for the first time in months. I used his name for my child's middle name to honor his help. The next morning, we called the police. They brought me to the local domestic violence shelter. Jay found the shelter quickly, so they gave me a bus ticket up to a different DV shelter in a different state. By the time I arrived at the new shelter, I had stopped speaking completely and could only stutter or write my responses. During my time there, the only person who knew where I was was my ex-husband, I knew I could trust my ex not to tell anybody where I was, and I knew I could trust him to be a good daddy to our son. I gave birth to a healthy baby girl by myself in the hospital, with doctors, of course. 
During my pregnancy, too many people told me to get rid of it, but I chose to fight for my baby. My daughter knows that she saved my life. If she wasn't inside of me, I would not have fought. I would have died. Within six weeks of her birth, I had my own apartment and a job. I was still in contact with Jay because he was, after all, her father. But by this time, I knew to keep him at arm's length. Skip ahead to today. My son is 16 and remains with his father and bonus mom. We have always been in touch with several visits, and I am glad he has a stable, loving home to grow up in, with tons of extended family and friends. Once I got better, I chose to let him stay with his father. It would have been selfish of me to take him away just so I could have him. I'm glad I chose stability for him because he is thriving, has his first summer job to pay for his own car insurance. Good kid with a bright future ahead. My daughter is 12 and has known nothing but peace, stability, and love in her life. I've already written too much, so I won't explain how, but we have been safe and joyful living with Jay's father for the past 10 years. I know it's weird, but it all worked out for the best. I do not regret my experiences because they have made me more compassionate, more caring, kinder, wiser, and stronger. I am in a good place now and feel like I earned this safety after my lifetime of trauma. I finally learned to accept real love. I never had that before, and I'm grateful for every single day of the life that I have now. I am disabled, but I am safe and loved. I am financially poor, but my children have all their needs and even some wants met. I have a support system. I know people who like and respect me again, and I finally like myself as well. There is hope. Never give up fighting for what is right. All right, so this happened my junior year of high school. One of my best friends invited me to a Halloween party at her house with our school friends and some of her friends from her previous school. When I got there, I was wearing a poor iteration of Tom Cruise and Top Gun. My friend introduced me to this girl, and we actually hit it off pretty well. She told me that my friend had told her a lot about me, and they knew each other through their parents' work. We started talking about our interests and were decently flirty with each other. Now, I had gotten out of my first real relationship earlier that year, and I was not one to hop around from girl to girl, so... Being really flirty with someone on my first time meeting them was not something I was used to doing. At the end of the night, we were sitting in the ground floor of my friend's house, and we ended up kissing, you know, for a little bit, which, again, was moving really fast for me. We started texting after that, but I kind of had a weird feeling about her and couldn't really see myself being in a relationship with her. But prior to realizing that, we had made plans for a date with my friend who threw the party and her boyfriend. When the day of the date came, I had come down with a 101.7 degree fever and felt very out of it. I called and explained to her that I was sick and was extremely sorry, but I wouldn't be able to make it to the date. This was a solid three to four hours before we were supposed to meet, so I wasn't pulling this last minute. Her response kicked off the most backward period of my high school life. She responded by saying, Well, I wasn't going to tell you this earlier, but I have brain cancer. Brain cancer. So I don't have much time to go on dates. The strangest part was she asked me to not tell anyone about it at all. She stated that this was because her father didn't want to use her cancer as a way to work people over to get stuff, which I found very odd. Now, a little backstory. I had a football coach who had passed away of cancer, and my friend's mom, the friend who threw the party, also developed cancer about that time. So, the topic of cancer was heavy on my heart. 
and I felt incredible guilt, and, being the emotionally charged person that I am, decided to go ahead and go on the date. During the date, she started saying that she really appreciated me coming and the way that I treated her. This made me feel better knowing that I was helping. At a point near the end of the date, we were walking towards my car when she again brought up that she appreciated the way I treat her. She followed it up by explaining that she wasn't used to guys treating her right because she was sexually assaulted when she was younger and actually had to have an abortion due to a forced pregnancy at the hand of a male relative of hers. My heart broke for her as she sounded like she had endured a lot of hardship on top of the fact that she was going to supposedly pass away from cancer in the next year. I was an emotional wreck following the date because it was a lot for me to take on, but I knew that if I all of a sudden stopped talking to her, I would never forgive myself. At this point, I had a small sense of suspicion of things that she had told me, especially the part about not telling anyone under any circumstances. That, coupled with a couple of things she had said on our date so far, about three, regarding what she wanted to do with her future and saying things like, I want to try it out, blankety-blank, hairstyle when I get older. After she said these things, she seemed to tense up a bit, but I chalked it up to her coming to terms with the fact that she wouldn't be able to do those things. My suspicions grew and grew, and eventually, I decided to try and do some investigating. Her father was a doctor at the place where I went for doctor things, and my personal doctor was a family friend of mine who knew her father very well. I asked her if there was anything I could do to support or help her regarding her cancer. My doctor looked at me and said, What cancer? She doesn't have cancer. I immediately became filled with anger and texted her telling her what I had learned. A day before, she had called me to let me know that her diagnosis was a mistake, but her tone was very melodramatic and not at all what I would expect as a response to finding out you didn't have a deadly disease. She tried to cover her tracks and was asking me why I would question her and was saying, I thought you cared about me. I am livid and blocked her on everything and blocked her number. I also fell into a pretty deep depression for the next week or two because of how much I was yanked around by this girl. And this interaction led me to have major trust issues with women, which I still have not gotten over. A couple of weeks later, I get a Facebook message request from a name that I didn't recognize. It was her. She had made a fake profile and was telling me I was being super immature and told me that she has some explaining to do. Yeah, no shit. I, of course, didn't answer, and that was the last I heard of her. Until a year and a half later. I had signed up for an ACT retake exam at my local university, and when I got there and sat down, I looked on to two seats in front of me and about three seats to the right, and guess who was there? We ended up talking, and she apologized for everything that she did in a relatively believable matter, and I forgave her. I never found out if any of the other things she told me about her life were even true, but I made sure to avoid her at all costs, which was a pain because she worked at a cold stone that was two minutes away from my house. I had to go to the one downtown, which was also still a pain. I came across her real Facebook profile recently as well, and she seems to be doing well, which I am glad to see. But as far as our interaction goes, it's never ever going to happen again. So it's 2011 and I'm newly divorced. I'm in my mid-twenties and a single mother, so I decide to try out some dating sites. I start talking with this guy on one of the sites. We seem to have a lot in common, and he seems pretty normal. I decide to give him my phone number. 
we continued chatting via text and phone calls. Well, I suggest we go get some coffee to meet up. He states he doesn't drink coffee. Okay, I suggest some drinks at a bar. He doesn't drink alcohol. Okay, well, he has a great idea. Let's go for a hike. I reluctantly agree. First red flag. He wants to go to this place called Batstow in South Jersey, which is a historic village with old abandoned buildings, hiking trails, and the home of the Jersey Devil. Great place for a first date. So I suggest we meet to the main parking lot. But no, he has a better idea. Let's meet at a train station nearby, and he'll drive us over because he knows of another entrance with better hiking trails. Yeah, next red flag. I again reluctantly agreed, not wanting to be rude. So the day of the day comes, and for whatever dumb reason, I don't tell anyone I'm doing this. I think because I was embarrassed I was using a dating site, and I knew someone in the back of my mind, my friends, would have tried to talk me out of it. So I pull into the train station, and he's there, in a late 90s Bronco. Okay, not so bad. We can't all afford new cars. He gets out, and he's actually the guy from the pictures. Okay, internal sigh of relief. We get in the car and start to head to the secret hiking trail entrance. We have a nice conversation on the way there. All seems good. We went there, and as we were getting out of the car, I go to grab my phone. He says, oh, no, just leave it here. I have mine. Red flag waving in my fucking face. Again, being polite and not wanting to argue, I comply. I see the entrances, and one points to this other trail that goes God knows where. I, again, being the good girl that I am, stay okay. Right before we go to set off, a bit of rebellion sets in, and I'm like, you know what, I should really have my phone with me. He starts to argue, and I'm like, no, I need it in case the babysitter calls about my son. He gives in and unlocks his car, and I grab my phone. Yay, one point for me. We set off down this trail side by side. We are talking, and everything seems okay. I start thinking. I was just overreacting before, so all is good. Well, we get to the part of the trail where you can only go one by one. So, I say, you go first and I'll follow. He says, oh no, you go. So in case you trip or anything, I can grab you. I do that nervous giggle thing and politely decline, saying how bad I am with following paths. He then insists I go first in a stern voice. Red flag with sirens here. I stupidly comply. The trail is getting narrower by the second, and the woods are getting darker because of the amount of trees, brush, etc. We are now no longer talking, and the only sounds are the crunching of our footsteps. The panic starts setting in. I look back at him, and he's just got the scowl on his face and a dead look in his eyes. I tried to smile at him, but nothing. So I stop, and I say... You know what? Let's turn back. I liked it better when we would walk next to each other and talk, still being polite. He says he wants to keep going this way. So I say no, I really want to go back the other way. And I start to just do that. As I go to walk past, he grabs my arm and blocks my path. I don't say anything and just casually grab my phone out of my pocket, not saying anything. He lets me go, says fucking whatever, and we walk back towards the car in silence, me with my phone in my hand the entire time. I amazingly did have signal. As we reach the clearing where the car was parked, he looks at his watch and states he has to go now. He has somewhere to be. We were only on this date for less than an hour, but okay, I'm not complaining. For whatever dumb reason, I get back in his car. We drive in almost near silence the entire way back to my car, me with a death grip on my phone and him looking miserable. He drops me off at my car and speeds away. 
I never hear from him again. In my nativity, I want to believe there was no chemistry between us. But let's be honest. When I decided to fuck politeness and grab my phone that day, I spoiled his dastardly plans. In 2016, my cousin Anna met a man named Jonathan. They were extremely happy together, to the point that in 2018, they got engaged. Anna, however, cheated on Jonathan shortly after with my man named Link. This was poorly solved by an idea to have a polyamorous relationship with Link. As time went on, Link turned into a horrific housemate and boyfriend. So, Anna and Jonathan decided it was time to remove him. This proved extremely difficult. Anna started by asking him to leave, and it didn't work. He refused to go. The landlord also refused to evict him due to him doing no wrong. They decided he needed a reason to leave, and I was tasked with removing him. I'm a complete pacifist, but I am also six foot four and scared the fuck out of him. I told him to leave, and after, I had a short conversation with the landlord when he had called. He was forced to leave via eviction notice. After he was kicked out, he revealed that he was only there for Anna, who would have fucking guessed, and that he would revive the relationship. This was accomplished in a weird way. He was stalking her consistently, followed her home from work, standing at her car when she went into a store, just being all around creepy. This was not only bound to her, though. He followed everyone else in the house. He would even keep tabs on me. I saw him watching me in the school parking lot, and we decided things had to change. One night, I visited them and told them about that event, and Anna decided enough was enough. She called Link and told him to fuck off, and she would call the cops if she saw him again. We all went to sleep and thought that would be the end of it. And boy, were we wrong. It was exactly seven in the morning, and I was woken up to what sounded like thunder over and over again. The entire house was shaking. He was at the front door, pounding it, trying to get in, because he was so crazy. I had carried a gun to their house that night before, just in case of this, and I yelled, I'm ready to fucking kill you if you're ready to fucking die. He took this notice seriously, and the cops were angry at me for threatening him, but due to the circumstances, they let me go. I was there a month later and was having a good time with them, playing video games, beating Jonathan's ass in Mortal Kombat, as I do, and then I saw him looking at me through the window, and I freaked the fuck out. It was like a big-ass spider crawling up your arm. He bolted the moment I saw him, and I couldn't sleep that night. A few nights ago, I visited again, and I woke up in the middle of the night. I wanted a glass of chocolate milk and an ibuprofen, as my head was hurting, and I needed some sleep. So I went to the kitchen, and guess who was there? He had a big fucking knife in his right hand. I remember freezing and looking at him. His pupils looked dilated, and he freaked me the fuck out. He said, Teutonic, it's not what it looks like. I'm here to stab Jonathan in the face. I just love her so much, and everything was fine before she intervened. I ended up attacking him and got the knife away before he ran. When the police finally caught him, they informed us that they would hold him for a bit and give him a warning, but technically it was still his house as he was never evicted and that we needed a restraining order to keep him away. Why are you writing this now, you might ask? Well, it's the only way I can sleep to write about my experiences. Hopefully, he will slip up and get arrested or something, but as long as he's around, I'm having trouble sleeping, and I'm scared for everyone I care about's life.
So I matched with this girl on Tinder. Her name is Jenna. Jenna and I went on our first date on January 16th. She knew I was out of a long-term relationship and still maintained occasional contact with my ex, Mary. Jenna and I officially started calling each other boyfriend and girlfriend around mid-February. Three days ago, while I'm in the shower, she goes through my phone and reads old messages between Mary and I. A few casual ones and a few very affectionate ones from before, Jenna and I had even started seeing each other or even met. Jenna packs all of her things and is heading out of the door when I get out of the shower with my phone. She texts a bunch of people saying things like, I'm an asshole and Mary is a manipulative bitch. She hacks into my Facebook and makes a post calling Mary a whole slew of names and blocks and unfriends several of my personal friends. She does a similar thing with Twitter. I get hold of a co-worker's phone and use it to try and contact her and sign back into my Facebook. Once she realizes I did this, she changed my passwords and my email passwords as well. Eventually, she tells me she wants to talk this out and to meet at my place. I play along so I can get my phone and passwords back. She gives me my phone and makes me call Mary and tell her I'm cutting her out of my life. I got a hold of Mary earlier and warned her something like this might happen. We both have a background in theater, so we had a very convincing argument over speakerphone so Jenna can hear. Jenna gave me my passwords and I immediately changed them. I tell her she should leave and she doesn't understand why I want her out of my life. She goes home very upset about me breaking up with her like this. Jenna starts posting and commenting on my Facebook and I block her. I block her on everything and she begins calling me over and over and over. Not saying anything when I try to pick up the phone. So I block her number. I start receiving the same calls over and over from a Colorado number. I happen to live in Canada, by the way. Eventually, I go to my phone provider and change my number. I also changed the locks on my door in case she took a key. The next day, she makes a Facebook page calling me a piece of shit and Mary, a manipulative C word that I can't say right now on YouTube, and she hacks into my alt Twitter account. I tell her if she calls her one more time or posts any more things about anybody I know, I'm going to call the police. I get an email saying that my application for a credit card, with a bank that I do not use, has been approved. I call the bank and tell them what's happening, and they put a freeze on the account. Several friends have told me to call the police, and I finally realize enough is enough. The police come and tell me that she has some sort of file with them, and that her name isn't even Jenna. It's something completely different. They issue a warning of harassment, and if she tries to contact me again, I call the police and she gets arrested. On Monday, I have to call all the fraud people and get all of my accounts frozen and investigated and stuff. Just a huge fucking headache. I realize this is a lot, but this is actually a pretty bare-bones version of the story. Basically, the reason I'm even sharing with you is now that the police are involved. I've had my locks changed and my number changed and all is quote, quote, solved. I'm starting to feel the emotional damage of being abused and harassed by someone I was really starting to care about and I don't know how to deal with it. So aside from calling the police, how would you handle this situation? This story is about my dad's ex-girlfriend. My dad has horrible luck with women. He is like a crazy magnet. Every woman he has ever dated, except his current girlfriend, has been abusive both mentally and physically. This list includes my mother, but the story is about his last girlfriend, Mary. 
She has gone from stalking not only him, but me, my husband, and our daughter, too. They met at a Christmas party and hit it off. He had just gotten out of another bad relationship with a different woman that he had been on and off again for three years. She was the classic narcissist type. Well, Mary seemed different. She claimed she was also just out of an abusive relationship. They went out for a few months, but she never let Dad over to her place. He didn't find it all weird until he received a call from a man who said Mary was his wife and wanted to know how my dad knew her. At first, Dad thought the guy was her ex still trying to control her. But things started to add up. He finally confronted Mary, and she gave him some sob story about how her ex was refusing to sign the papers. But they were separated. Dad did a bit of digging and even talked to Mary's parents at one point. He found out that not only was Mary definitely still married, but she wasn't even separated from her husband. As far as everyone in her life knew, she was happily married, and my dad was just a friend, if they knew about him at all. Needless to say, he broke up with her. She lost it, started showing up at his work, calling in the middle of the night, texting him 50 times a day, all that good stuff. My dad moved states twice and changed his number several times to try and get away from her, but she always found him. Love letters would arrive in the mail, or she would call and say she was coming to see him. Then she found my phone number, probably some time after my dad moved in with me. She started texting me almost as much as him. Once I married my husband and had my daughter, she really went all out, sending me presents for her new granddaughter, always wanting updates and the like. I never replied and either sent back unopened packages or donated the items she had sent directly to me from shops. Everything finally came to a head when she arrived at my dad's doorstep while he was at work with a casserole for him. She gave it to his roommate and told him it was because she noticed my dad was losing weight. He told his roommate to toss it. He didn't want to risk poison since he had just applied for a restraining order. That same night, she showed up at my apartment while my husband worked the overnight shift. It was after 1 a.m. when she started knocking on my door. I was glad that I had sent my toddler to my aunt and uncle's for the night when I saw it was her. She left banana bread at my doorstep that we threw out as soon as my husband got home. The next night, I again left my toddler with my aunt and uncle in case she came back. And, of course, she did. I started getting texts from her as she pounded on my door. She wanted to see her grandbaby and have some girl time with me. They slowly devolved into demands for me to open the door. I called the cops. While I was on the phone with dispatch, my neighbor came out ready to take her on. He told her cops were on the way since his wife was already calling them. She disappeared pretty quick into the park across the street. The cops didn't catch her, but my dad's restraining order did get granted. We have since moved across the state, but she still texts me from time to time wanting to know how my dad is or what my daughter is up to. I never answer, but I do save all of her texts just in case I have to get my own restraining order against this crazy woman. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true crazy exes stories. Before I go on any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Comey Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Again, thank you all for being the pillar of which BTA stands. I can't tell you how much I'm appreciative for your support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
to the other subscribers, supporters, or brand new faces amongst the crowd. Thank you all for your support. Without you, I don't have a voice, and this channel would not exist. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you kindly. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.